it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Those of you who are regulars to the channel might recognize the first part of this story. It was originally a standalone episode, didn't know if uh, part two was coming, called The Mad Prophet. And I'm very happy to say, based on uh, the feedback that you all gave, there is now a second installment of this. So uh, please check the timestamps in the video description if you've already heard the first part of this story. Right, here we go with part one. The Mad Prophet. Well, I've seen a lot of shit in my day as a detective. From brutal murders committed by intelligent killers to simple killings from gunshot wounds to the head or chest. But for the past year, I've investigated what appeared to be some type of ritualistic murders that didn't match up with anything else I'd seen or heard before. Each crime scene was the same. Four victims ranging from early 20s to late 40s. Naked, wrists bound by rope, knelt down surrounding a tree with their heads snapped backwards where their faces would be facing the sky, except all of their eyes were missing. And each and every one of them had this strange eight-pointed star carved into their backs with one eye in each triangle and a monstrous mouth of teeth branded in the center of the star. The killer had left no fingerprints, not a single trace for us to track down and find the bastard. That was until he called us from his own phone and gave us his exact address. He told us he was ready to be taken in. Well, I didn't get to hear his voice since I was talking to my boss. Curious as to why he wanted us to find him, but eager to bring down that son of a bitch, we pounced on the opportunity. Now, this fucker lived out in the rural area of the state. Swat and my partner and I drove all the way to this killer's house in the dead of night. I can still remember that night vividly. It was raining hard as hell. The spring air was unusually colder than it normally was, and even though my partner and I were anxious to get this bastard, we both couldn't shake this feeling of an odd, subtle dread. 2.28 a.m. That's when we arrived at the killer's house in this clearing in the forest of oak trees whose dark shadows seemed to give off this eerie feeling like they themselves were watching us. The house was one story, almost the size of a trailer home. Only the front room light of the house was on. It was this gloomy green. The SWAT team surrounded the house and then busted inside. My partner and I followed behind them. Once we entered the house, we were hit by this strange smell. It was oddly sweet, yet stank simultaneously. And all over the walls were ominous and insane writings and drawings of eyes in black paint, in marker and in crayon. We found the killer kneeling on the floor in the centre of the room, with his hands cuffed behind his back. He seemed to have torn out his own eyes. There were still bleeding scratches around the sockets that ran up his forehead and all over his face. Then he lifted his head up to face me, and I swear to Christ, I felt like he could see me as if he still had eyes. Detectives, he said in a light, gentle voice, acknowledging our presence. Good to finally meet you both. Get him the fuck out of here, I told the SWAT members who had hold of him. They took him outside and escorted him all the way back to headquarters to later be interrogated. Meanwhile, my partner, Detective Thomas, and I examined the house with forensics and about five police officers while others examined the surrounding area of the house. Now the writings on the walls, as I said, were somewhat deranged and ominous. I'll share some examples with you. Seize us all. Inside and outside, it watches us, knows us, wants us. Love and hate, merely designs, strings. Everything has strings. Everything is strings. Past, present, future. See all at once, everywhere all at once. But where is it? Find where it resides outside. I am its puppet. I am its voice speaking to itself. They got it all wrong. They're all insane. Just like me, but in different ways. But I see, I know, and I know. They come as they are made to. Just like how I was made to call them after my last piece of the same message. 
Well, that last message was the most coherent out of all of them, and it actually made the air feel like it had turned colder. Hey, Cara. Thomas caught me as he walked down the hallway to me from the bedroom. He was holding what appeared to be a custom-made black hardcover book. Thomas handed me the book. Hey, take a look at this. I flipped through the pages and saw the most peculiar and eerie sketches and drawings of what I could best describe as masses of eyes with dozens of insect-like legs of many kinds coming out with writhing tentacles as well. Each sketch was varied in size, sometimes in shape and form too. Then I discovered that some were even humanoid, yet still composed of the same lidless, multi-irised eyes with one single black pupil in the centre and writhing tentacles and insect legs. With each page I flipped, I felt this sense of unsettling vileness gradually build up more and more. I had to stop before the coming nausea got a bit too strong, closing it immediately and handing it back to Thomas, who ended up handing it to the forensics. Fucking weird, right? Thomas commented. Yeah, yeah, I coughed. Anything else found? Yeah, the guy mostly had a wardrobe of Walmart cheap clothes, such as black pants, a hoodie, jacket, emerald green plain t-shirts. No jewelry except for the old black watch and the two rings he had on him. A cabinet of his paint supplies with the markers and crayons are in his bedroom. Shelves with some books on the occult, astronomy, psychology, ancient world history books, and two books that kind of, well, stand out among the rest. What are they? I asked. One of the forensic members handed me the two. One was titled, The Existence of Pure Evil, and the cover art was of a valley of red flowers, dark green grass and pine green maple trees under a pinkish blue sky at sundown. I felt that familiar feeling of pure foulness bloom again inside me. I quickly turned my eyes to the other book, which was titled in violet font saying, Dark Meditation, with a black silhouette of a figure in the lotus position, with an eye similar to the ones in the book of drawings in the centre of the head. I handed the books back to the forensic member and said to Thomas, Well, this explains quite a bit. Anything else? Not really, Thomas replied. Just some bread, cereal, and a cup of noodles in the pantry. Some meat in the fridge with a couple of cartons of milk, some cheese, and pears as well. Gotta say, though, I've never seen anything like this in fifteen years, man. Same for me, Thomas, I agreed as I looked around at the writings and drawings on the wall. That sense of wrongness lingered in the air. Ah, this shit is something else. I don't freaking like it. Any ideas where all the victims' eyes are? If you kept him here or somewhere else? No clue yet. We'll ask the sick fuck when we get him back to headquarters. All right, well, let's go ask him then. We headed back outside, where it had finally stopped raining. Once we got back in our car, we headed straight to headquarters, where we'd plan on interrogating this self-proclaimed mad prophet. An hour later, we got back to HQ and were on our way to the interrogation room. Thomas told me he wanted me to interrogate the son of a bitch alone. I asked him why. He looked at me with fear in his eyes. Fear I'd never seen before. Now we've been in a few intense shootouts and seen some brutal shit, but he always kept his cool. But this, this was like he knew that if he entered the same room as the sick fuck we'd just caught, that some fucked up nightmare would come to life and swallow him whole. And lately I'm starting to think he was right. I, I just feel sick, he said softly, like he was trying his darndest to speak, but he was drugged and it was suppressing his ability to say a complete sentence. Something in that, something in that house. Go home then, man, I told him, patting him on the back. Get some rest and check with your doctor soon. Thomas just nodded and walked quickly to the exit and left took a deep breath and entered the dimly lit room that saw through the one-way mirror into the interrogation room. A couple of security guards and Officer Phillips, one of the police officers who was at the house as well, were watching the mad prophet, who was just sitting still, staring at the wall opposite him. Officer Phillips filled me in on the mad prophet's personal information. His name is Rowan Linegrain, Caucasian male, auburn hair, 35 years old, 185 pounds, 
His date of birth is California. Lives on his own. Had the house for five years. Family's been living in Oregon ever since he got the house, while he's stayed in state. What's he been doing? He's just been sitting there, humming to himself ever since the moment the SWAT team got him in their truck and brought him here. Humming? I asked, kind of confused but not entirely surprised. Yeah, just humming this weird, creepy tune. Also, the SWAT team that escorted him said they smelled a sweet, stinky smell, just like the one from his house. Have you got any news about where the victim's eyes are? I asked Officer Phillips. No, not yet, unfortunately. We tried getting the bastard to tell us, but he kept telling us that he'd tell you guys. Officer Phillips then looked behind us and noticed that Thomas wasn't with us. Oh, speaking of which, where is Detective Thomas? Uh, he went home, I told him. My eyes locked onto the mad prophet. Detective Thomas felt sick, so I'll be doing the interrogation by myself. All right, well, he's all yours then. I took another deep breath and walked up to the door leading into the interrogation room. One of the security guards unlocked the door and let me in, closing and locking it behind me. Once I stepped into that room, I felt that same uneasy foulness in the air like back in the mad prophet's house, when I was flipping through his book of drawings and that book, The Existence of Pure Evil. And Rowan's humming of that unsettling song wasn't helping at all. It almost sounded like the Aphex twins tracked grass, but the pitch was lowered and distorted a bit. Rowan stopped humming once I sat down across the table from him, where he sat chained to his chair. Detective, Rowan said with an unpleasant smile, where's your partner? Well, he's uh, not feeling too well, I told him. Now, since I've answered your question, how about you answer mine? Where's all twenty-four of your victim's eyes? I'm assuming you haven't found them. Rowan's voice had a soft and dreamy tone, but with a sinister feel to it. Are they in the deep of the woods at your place? I asked him. They're not there. You're looking in the wrong spots. You're looking in the wrong place. It doesn't matter anyways. They have them right now. They? Who's they? You've already seen them. Where? In my drawing book. You mean to tell me that those weird fucked up things you drew took all 24 of your victims' eyes? You know, I don't like being lied to. Oh, those weird fucked up things are called angels. Well, I understand you didn't know that's what they are. I'm telling the truth, and yes, the angels have all of their eyes. Besides, they don't need them where they are now. What do you mean where they are now? They're in a frickin' morgue, no thanks to you. Rowan let out a vile chuckle. They're spirits, detective. Their spirits is what I meant, not their bodies. Their spirits are in a much more beautiful place right now. Well, not beautiful to some, I suppose. What place? You saw a nice little depiction of it, Rowan told me. And that vile air became gradually thicker. I know you looked at that book, The Existence of Pure Evil. One of the best books, if not the best, I've ever read. I've been to that place that's depicted on the cover and talked about in the book. And I strongly doubt you even read much of it. Would you like me to tell you what it talks about? The wonderful information and truth it shares. It may help you understand why it killed those twenty-four beautifully violated souls. It may give you some of the answers you're looking for. I had to admit some subtly sickening curiosity overcame me. I should have just asked the questions I'd left for him, but I wanted to know. For some odd reason, I wanted to know. No, not need, I just wanted to know. All right, then, I said with a deep breath. <sighs> Tell me what it says. I'll do my best to summarize and simplify it as much as I can for you, Rowan told me with a sickly satisfied smile. But you'll learn more when you actually read the whole book for yourself, if you choose to. Oh, where to begin? Oh, yes. So let's start with the basic examples of evil. Evil is and can be people who steal, murder, abuse, manipulate and violate for their own benefit. Well, everyone knows that, I suppose. But what about pure evil? 
To most religious people, pure evil is the devil or Satan. Rowan let out another vile yet short chuckle. <laughs> Bitch, please, did they even read their holy books? Satan, the devil, or whatever the fuck you want to call him, rebelled against a lying version of God because he was a cocky or narcissistic guy who didn't like his dad or just didn't agree with him. Really? That made the guy pure evil? Did they even read any book on demonology? There are demons that are so fucking pure evil that every other demon, including Satan himself, despises them. Anyways, pure evil is not a person. Oh, pure evil is a force. Like a force of nature. An ancient force that's highly likely older than time itself, if that makes any sense. And sole purpose or intention, if it even has a consciousness to have intentions, violates everything and anything it touches, that it is even the tiniest speck of goodness and innocence in them. And it violates indiscriminately. Well, if we exclude, of course, the certain vessels it uses to spread its influence and presence. Because how can you violate something that's already defiled? Hmm, and I'm assuming you're one of those vessels, I slowly said to him, noticing right at that moment that it was gradually becoming a bit more difficult to speak. Yes, Rowan replied with a grin of pride. I'm a bit of a prophet, to spread its great word and spirit. Anyways, this force of pure evil doesn't really have a base form, not a form we can really wrap our minds around, but we can definitely feel it. And there are places where we can feel it stronger than others, possibly the strongest. Such as the place depicted on the cover of that book I mentioned earlier. That place really exists. Not here, well, okay, you can't really get there unless you make a bridge and cross it. And I know, I know you'd like to know how. How? I asked. Speaking was getting even more difficult now. It was like I was drugged, but... I wasn't, though, and that unholy feeling in the air was getting stronger. How to make a bridge to a place where pure evil is stronger or strongest, Rowan began. You must defile something considered holy or pure, like a holy symbol or holy place or a holy statue. No, I'm not talking about humping a statue of the Virgin Mary. I'm talking about painting the vilest shit possible on it or on the walls of the chapel. Oh, like what I did. Carve an eight-pointed star that represents salvation from Judeo-Christian beliefs. But I carved in the eyes of the angels you saw in my drawing book to make the bridge stronger and also to mark the victims more easily for the angels to come pick them up. You see, the angels as they are referred to in the book are angels of pure evil, as you've probably figured out by now. They are its much more ancient servants, and also helpers of those who want to complete the bridge and cross it. What about the mouth? That's supposed to symbolize the mouth of pure evil itself, swallowing the spirits of its victims into its depths. And honestly, the symbol I carved fitted perfectly. Especially since, you know, eight points. Eight symbolizes infinity. Pure evil is infinite, that whole thing, so... After I mark the victims, one of the angels comes to take the four victims' eyes. And oh my freaking God, is it the most blissfully violating feelings ever? Well, violating if you were still somewhat pure or whatever. Still, when they arrive, that vile atmosphere they bring is so intense. It'd make an entire city of people feel like they were getting violated by their loved ones in a cathedral. But for me, well, it was pure pleasure. The way he moaned that last sentence in foul pleasure began to make my already sickened insides feel like they were tearing at each other. But Rowan continued. And just for your information, you only need eight victims to do your little sacrifice to enter that lovely place where pure evil can be felt near its peak. But I decided to add sixteen more, because <laughs> why not? Well, I enjoyed it. I wanted more people to experience that beautiful place. Which finally brings us to the details about a place of pure evil. A place to have pure evil's presence at its strongest must be a place that looks beautiful, or a place that looks like it was once holy or sacred. And that place is defiled by pure evil itself. Now this place isn't reachable on this earth without a bridge, but you can cross that bridge finally after you've sacrificed your eight or more victims, 
by simply reciting some verses or chants found in the book, which I'll leave you to find out for yourself. After those last words of his, it went quiet for two straight minutes, which I swear to Christ felt like hours. For some damn reason I couldn't explain at the time that I knew, I just knew that Rowan was telling me the truth about every single thing. But I'd find out for sure myself later that month that what he told me was real, that it is real. I got up from my chair and had the security guard unlock the door for me. Quickly I left the room, but once I got into the hallway, I fell to the floor onto my knees, almost dry heaving. Hey, Detective Carter. Officer Phillips called to me. He ran up to my side and asked, Are you feeling okay? Need me to call you an ambul- No. I stopped him with a gasp as I shook my head. Gradually I started to feel better, but I needed to get as far away as I could from Rowan. Take that fuck back to his cell, please. After I get home, of course. I got back up to my feet, my breathing slowly becoming less and less heavy. This is freaking weird, Detective Carter, Officer Phillips told me. I forgot to mention this. I don't know why I forgot, but when he was brought here to HQ, we didn't find any disease or chemical-related shit on him. Nothing that caused people such as yourself to dry heave and get sick like that. Plus the guys who were in the truck with him, watching him, they said they felt ill after getting him in there. Not like with the flu, just, well, sick in the gut and uneasy as hell. Something just feels very wrong about that bastard. I don't like it at all. Well, I doubt anyone likes it, I replied as I wiped some of the sweat from my face. But i got to get back home. i got to get some rest. Keep a careful eye on him, Phillips. You call me right away if anything happens. Well do. Just make sure you get some sleep. Yeah, I muttered as I walked to the exit. If I can sleep at all tonight. I did get some sleep, but my dreams were some of the most vivid nightmares I'd had in years. And what happened next somehow made things worse, even though Rowan was behind bars. He died in his cell. Rowan somehow died around 8am while I was asleep back at my house. Well, I rushed right over after Officer Phillips caught me as soon as they'd found him lying cold in his bed. I showed up, still in my clothes from yesterday, and walked quickly to his cell where Officer Phillips was standing dumbfounded at what had just happened. How the hell did he die? I asked Phillips as I checked Rowan's body for any sign of poison or self-inflicted wounds. I don't freaking know, Detective, Phillips answered me. We checked the video feed watching his cell and it showed nothing but him going to sleep. Nothing of him slitting his wrists or neck or swallowing anything that could have been poison. And Rowan's body supported Phillips' story. I couldn't find a damn trace of any self-inflicted wounds. Officer Phillips let me check out the video footage of Rowan's cell, showing every second of what he did. And he was right. There was not a single moment where he swallowed anything or even where he'd cut his vital arteries or neck. All we could do was hope the autopsy would show something that we believe we might have missed. But still, it wasn't right. With Rowan being dead before he could have gone to court and be tried for his crimes, and where the families of his victims would have seen him rightfully executed. And what Officer Phillips told me next didn't make things any better. All the other prisoners close by him told us the same thing of around the time Rowan died. Phillips told me as we walked down the hall to the front doors. They all said they felt something vile, something so foul that they almost began to cry. Cry? I asked as we passed through the front doors and out into the cool morning air. Yeah, almost began to cry from complete fear. Oh, fuck. I have to check up on Thomas and update him on this. Hope he's doing all right. Also, uh, Phillips, I've got a favor to ask you. Sure, what? I'm going to need to have printed photocopies of two of Rowan's books. Yeah, sure, Detective Carter, Philip said as he pulled out a pen and notepad. Which ones? I need photocopies of the existence of pure evil and that dark meditation one, as soon as you can. Especially when I get back after I check up and update Detective Thomas on this whole situation. Got it. I'll get those two copied for you and ready by the time you get back. Thanks. I tried calling Thomas's phone once I got in my car, but he didn't pick up at all. So I drove to his house, which took me about ten minutes. 
He lived in the suburban area of the city, same place where my house was at, except I was about ten blocks away from where he lived. Once I quickly parked in front of his lawn, I turned off the car and walked quickly to his front door, knocking on it loud enough to hopefully wake him up. Thomas did eventually end up opening the door. He was in a tank top and gym shorts. Carter, he asked with squinted eyes, looking like he'd just woken up. Hey man, how's it going? How'd the interrogation go with Rowan? Thomas, I said to him, looking into those brown eyes of his. Rowan just died this morning. <laughs> no wonder I feel better. Well, his reply took me by surprise. Wait, what? I stuttered. Well, I gotta be honest with you. The fuck made me feel sick, I mean, literally. Even without touching the bastard, I felt like I was going to seize up or vomit from just being in the same room as him. That's why I'm grateful you did the interrogation instead of me. Because, to be honest, if I did it with you, I probably would have ended up in hospital. Just don't ask me why. I just know that that's how it would have played out. Something was really wrong with that fuck. And I couldn't be happier that he's dead. Yeah, and I, well, I know it may sound weird, especially after that last psychopath we caught back in 2017. How I handled everything fine back then, but I honestly couldn't wait till Rowan was dead. I'm glad he is. Anyways, was there something else you wanted to tell me? Oh, no, not really. Hey, did you call your doctor at all? No, didn't need to. Like I said, I'm fine now. Woke up feeling much better than last night. I'll come into the station in an hour. Just got to take a shower and get some breakfast. Okay, I'll see you there then. Thomas just nodded and closed the door in front of me. I got back into my car and returned to the station after picking up some breakfast on the way back. When I got to my desk, I noticed a pocket folder with the words Dark Meditation written on it, with the photocopies of the actual book paper clipped together inside. I flipped through the pages and noticed there were eight chapters and 150 pages in total. There was no author listed anywhere in it at all. Thomas showed up right when he said he would, and to be honest, he actually looked much better than he had the night before. What you got there? He asked me as he sat at his desk across from mine. Dark meditation, I answered him as I began to read it from the beginning. I asked Officer Phillips if he could photocopy those two books we'd found at Ron's house for me. I'm assuming he's still working on getting the other one copied right now. Well, enjoy reading that spooky shit, he joked. I'm going to work on letting the families of the victims know that the bastard's finally dead, after I let the boss know that I'm okay. Oh, fine by me. Thomas left, and I stayed glued to my chair, reading every passage of my photocopy of Dark Meditation. The peculiar and obviously dark book talked about the history of the ways of well, how to gain grim, ancient, forbidden knowledge, how to communicate and come in contact with dark, otherworldly entities from nightmare scapes simply called the Dreadful Ones, and unwelcomed alien beings known as the Foul Angels, oh, and how to travel to those nightmare scapes and places of evil. Most of the methods to achieve what one desired of what was listed in this book was performing sinister or considerably unholy and strange rituals. The last two methods were chance to gain that dark knowledge and communicate with a dreadful one. It took me about four hours to finish the whole damn thing. As I was going over it again to start highlighting stuff, Officer Phillips came up to me and handed me another pocket folder with the words The Existence of Pure Evil written on the front. Yeah, I got this one done for you, he told me as I skimmed through it. He noticed I had dark meditation opened up with a few passages already highlighted. Find any valuable info in that one? He asked, pointing his finger to it. Mm, some, I replied, as I continued to skim through the other photocopy book. You remember those weird, creepy sketches in that drawing book he had? Yep. Well, the descriptions of some of these foul angels that are mentioned in the book match a few of those drawings. What about the others? Oh, nothing. I think he saw the rest himself. Hallucinated them or dreamt them. Besides, the ones listed in the book are only examples anyways. Three out of the twelve, to be exact. As for the other beings talked about. Oh, weird. Well, I'm going to go home. Done with my shift. Good luck with all that. Uh, thanks. Later that day, Thomas told me how talking to some of the families had gone. and We went over all the shit that had happened with Rowan, from his first killings to his unexpected death. 
As the next two weeks passed by, I read both photocopies of Dark Meditation and the existence of pure evil thoroughly, highlighting specific passages that stood out to me. While the existence of pure evil went into more detail about the foul angels and the places of pure evil, along with a perspective written about pure evil as a force itself also with murderous rituals that almost exactly aligned with what Rowan had done. As I read that particular book, Rowan's words to me echoed through my mind. What he told me during his interrogation matched perfectly with what was detailed in the book. The thing is, when he told me these things, he said it with such confidence and conviction, like he himself actually met with the foul angels and went to those places where pure evil's presence was at its strongest. And, as I mentioned in the previous part, I really believed him, and reading those two books just supported my belief and my gut feeling that he had told me the truth. But the horrible thing, though, was that I was soon to see for myself the reality of it all. On the Thursday night of the final week of that month, out of an ever-growing insatiable curiosity to see it for myself, out of some insane need for some deranged form of closure, I performed one of the rituals listed in Dark Meditation. 11.15pm is when I began the ritual, naked in my very home. Rather than killing innocent people, I took the ashes of my deceased wife and carefully poured them onto the velvet red carpet into an eight-pointed star and drew an eye in each triangle and a horrific mouth in the centre, just like the one Rowan had carved into his victims. I then pushed myself to masturbate and use my semen to smear the ashes into the carpet. Then I began the incantation in a soft-spoken voice with my eyes closed. Oh, angels of pure evil, I spoke softly. Oh, foul angels of the one true God, I make this unholy mark as a sacrifice, an offering for you, for one of you to come unto me. Come unto me, oh great foul one, for I desire to go where the presence of the one true God, pure evil itself, is strongest so I may bathe in its violating touch and experience its vile beauty. Come unto me, O foul one. Come unto me, come unto me. Suddenly I began to feel something awful getting closer to me. I can't say where from exactly. It was as if it was coming from every direction. The vile feeling became stronger and stronger, soon surpassing the intensity of when I was in the interrogation room with Rowan. And then it got to a point where I began dry heaving and eventually vomited red bile right into the centre of the mouth drawn from my dead wife's ashes. My eyes were watering as my hands gripped the fabric of the carpet tightly. Then something told me to lift my head up to face the wall across the room. And that's where I saw it appear, fading slowly into existence. It was an atrocious abomination to reality, to my very eyes. The form of it was mostly transparent, but with a gloomy, greenish light to it. But I could see its numerous writhing, insect-like legs that came from the outline of its sphere-like centre, where there were countless soul-penetrating eyes. It felt like this went on for hours, that foul one violating my mind with images of every unholy ritual and vile atrocity it had committed. And then, suddenly, all of it stopped with my vision going black and the feeling of vileness quickly dissipating. My vision came back slowly, but I was no longer in the living room of my house. No, I was somewhere else. Somewhere that I should never have gone to. A valley of nauseatingly red flowers, dark, grotesquely green grass, and sickly pine-green maple trees blown by a lukewarm breeze under a vile, pinkish-blue sky at sundown. No... I groaned in slowly building fear. No, 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 no. And then it began. A feeling of pure evil, fouler than that of the abomination I'd seen in my house, quickly flooding through my entire being. Oh, God, no one should ever feel something like that. It felt like I was being violated while I witnessed my wife being raped in front of me over and over and over again. Inside the very church we'd been married in, but intensified beyond what my mind and soul could endure. It felt so fucking violating, so overwhelmingly violating, that I began to cry out of absolute fear, not just for my sanity, but for my very soul. 
I wish, though, I had been driven insane. That would have been a mercy. But there, in that seemingly beautiful place, with the most vilest feelings in all of comprehension, I wasn't allowed to have my mind shatter into the blissful obliviousness of insanity. No, I was forced to endure it all, every single nanosecond. I would writhe and roll back and forth as I groaned and screamed through my clenched teeth like a feral animal as tears constantly ran down my face. I tried as much as I could to pray to whatever god to save me from that evil place, but the mental prayers I tried saying in my mind wouldn't last more than five seconds. They'd be interrupted and replaced by horrific images and scenes that are too sinister and depraved to even describe. All those poor souls were violated in both comprehensible and incomprehensible ways, and I could see my wife among them. Was it weeks, months, years, or decades of my mental and spiritual agony there? I can't tell, forcing myself to look back now. It never got darker or lighter. It was eternally sundown, just like that. I don't remember how I got back. All I do remember after that was waking up, back in my living room. I spent a good hour straight, crying out of fear from what had just happened to me. But as I felt something drip down my thighs from my anus, the relief of being back from that horrid place was soon torn to shreds. I touched the sticky substance from my inner thigh and looked to my horror. It smelled like a sickly, sweet and stinky smell. Well, later, I tried washing and cleaning the stained symbol out of the carpet, but it had left its mark permanently. I managed to get most of the ashes out, though. Still, I regret doing that with my wife's ashes, and I regret reading those books. I regret doing that ritual. I deeply regret it all. But I have to live with that now for the rest of my life, and quite possibly for the rest of eternity. I burn those photocopies of the books, but all of what I've read from them has seared into my mind. Every night I have dreams of that foul place, and of that foul angel. I'm thinking of tearing up the red carpet and getting a new one. But I'm conflicted because my wife loved that carpet, yet I defiled it with what I've done. Nothing helps distract me or gives me relief from what happened. And nothing will help. And the worst part of it all is that I have this deep, strong feeling in my gut that, after I die, I'll be taken back to that place of pure evil and we'll stay there forever. Part 2 The Empty Detective I don't know what I fear more. Pure evil that sole existence is dedicated to violating life and existence, or a man who is possessed by a timeless, horrifying emptiness that evil itself dreads. And I don't even know if I regret what I did, especially after all that's happened. Well, I had to save my partner. This is Detective Thomas, Carter's partner and friend. I'm writing here because I believe you guys would like to know what's happened since the whole ordeal after Carter's admittedly stupid decision over what he did after Rowan died, and because Carter himself doesn't seem to care to even inform you guys. You see... After Carter went to that place he shouldn't have gone to in the first place, well, the guy just became a wreck. He ended up almost becoming an alcoholic. Every day at work I noticed he was a bit on edge and even started smoking. Well, the guy was three years clean from any nicotine before he picked it up again, so now I knew something was up. Hell, I'd ask him as much as I could about why he was acting like this, and he'd always tell me the same thing. The whole experience with Rowan disturbed him to that point that he was at now, but I knew he wasn't telling me the whole story of what was really going on. That's when I decided to pay him a visit at his place. It was around 9.30pm on a Wednesday. I knocked on his door. He opened the door and I saw him with his shirt unbuttoned and a bottle of whiskey in his hand. Hey Thomas, he said to me with a weak voice. What's up? I just wanted to come by and see how you're doing, man, I told him. May I come in? Carter nodded and turned around to walk to his couch. I closed the door behind us and saw bottles of whiskey and ale on his counters with numerous packs of cigarettes. 
He was already sat down on the couch, lighting a Marlboro with his Zippo lighter. I sat on the chair across from him and asked him, How are you, man? Damn, you look like shit. Like I've told you before, Carter replied after taking a drag on his Marlboro. That's how I cope with the whole shit with Rowan. Oh, fuck, I don't even want to say his name out loud or even think it. Listen, man, I know you're not telling me the whole truth. You didn't start drinking this hard and smoking again even a week after Rowan died. And you started this shit a lot later than that. I noticed that you were a karma before that last week of the month. What happened? What happened that last week? Well, my partner began to tremble and burst into tears. Oh, God, he cried. Uh, I went there, Thomas. I saw it. I saw a foul angel and it took me there. It took me to that place. I can't describe it. Oh, it was so freaking awful, so vile, evil. I don't think there's any word that can describe it best at all. And it showed me things. Things nobody should ever see. But I can still see them. His voice turned from being filled with sorrow and regret to fear. I can still see that place and the things it showed me in my dreams. Every night. I can still see that angel. Worst of all is that I can still feel the familiar atrociousness, but more subtle. Subtle enough to make me uneasy every moment of my life. I'm afraid, Thomas. I'm afraid that I'm going to go to that awful place after I die. No, I know I'm going there. My soul is exposed to it. I can feel its grasp around me. Jeez, man, I groaned. After all we'd gone through together, I knew now that Carter was telling me the truth. I don't know what to say. Is there anything we can do? Is there anything I can do? There's got to be some way to get you out of this mess. I don't know, Carter replied with unease. I don't think there's anything that could help. What about those two books? The book on that pure evil shit? I can't remember much of it. Not after what's happened. I don't want to remember any of it, to be honest. What about the other book? That dog meditation one? I just talked about how to communicate work with and make packs with two different types of entities. The foul angels and... He paused. His face. I could tell fear was still there, but it had changed into something else. Some other type of fear I'd never seen. In fact, I got a chill that made the hairs on my arm stand up from just seeing it. Them! Carter muttered with his eyes widening. The others! What? I said, curious to know anything that he knew. What others? Oh, the book. The dark meditation one. It mentioned briefly in the middle of it that, well, it said something along the lines of, though both entities are ones of dark nature, the Sumner should not make pacts with one when they've been touched by the other. Otherwise the Sumner will be void. Oh, I can't believe I forgot about that. What the hell does that mean? Oh, the dreadful ones. They're the others, the other dark entities. I think it means that if we are... Well, if I summon a dreadful one and make a pad with it, I'll be free of this. I'll be free of all of this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're talking about using dark shit to get rid of other dark shit. This does not sound like it's going to end well. No. Carter said as he tried breathing heavy, even breaths to calm down as he took the last drag of his smoke. But I don't see any other alternative right now. And if what I remember is correct, this may be my only shot at getting rid of this evil that's inside of me, that's haunting me. And I'd rather be void, well, whatever the book meant by that. I sighed, rubbed my hands over my face and head. Looking into Carter's eyes, Seeing complete desperation and anxiousness, I couldn't help but oblige. Who knew how long it would be until he'd snap or end up in a psychiatric ward or get suspended for something he'd regret doing? I needed to help him out. Well, it's just that those words he'd said that were in that book of dark meditation. The summoner will be void. 
Uh, that did not sit well with me. So I told Carter I'd do it. I'd help out. We shook hands and said goodnight to each other. Right after I left his place, I drove to HQ. As soon as I got there, I had Officer Phillips make a photocopy of the Dark Meditations book right away. I sat at my desk, thoughts of what was going to happen running through my mind. Horrific scenarios intruded, and I started shaking my left leg in anxious impatience. Luckily, before it got too overwhelming, Officer Phillips made me jump by plopping the folder he'd made with a complete photocopy of the Dark Meditations book in front of me. I'm wiped out and almost done with my shift, Officer Phillips told me. Catch you later, Thomas. Yeah, see you later, Phillips. I sighed as I flipped through the photocopy making sure it was all there, which it was. Then I went back home, bringing the photocopy of Dark Meditation with me, passed out in my chair with my uniform still on. The next morning, all the way to noon, I read through Dark Meditations twice. Carter's memory served him well of that passage describing the whole, don't make a pact with one if you're touched by the other. It was there, described in the page in the center of the book, and it said exactly this. If the summoner has been touched by the presence of one force or entity of one kind, and they make a pact with the entities of another, the summoner will become void. Void not in physical form, but in spiritual. For the entities of the nightmare escapes and the entities of pure evil do not coexist, even though both are of a dark nature. The soul of the summoner will be stripped of who they are, but not of what they are. So take heed of these final warnings. The process cannot be reversed, and one must be gravely informed that if the summoner makes a pact with a dreadful one after being touched by a foul angel, their soul after death is the dreadful one's to take to the realm between its realm and the foul angel. Oh, fuck. I sighed. Is there really no other way? I was going to be helping Carter make a deal with a devil to get away from another devil, and the feeling I got from reading about the dreadful ones was not good. I got this sense of dread, but not the same dread I'd felt when dealing with Rowan and that absolute evil shit. No, this was more of a dreamlike dread. A dread that you can only feel in your dreams. A creeping fear that's not foul, but that is abysmal and, like black sentient smoke, is crawling through the cracks from both outside of the house of your mind and from within. And yet I had to do this. I couldn't find any other way. I had to help my partner, my friend, even though the cost would be grim. Well, I thought it'd be better than leaving him to the fate he was facing at the time. And so, after we both got off of work... I followed him to his house and we began to prepare for the peculiar ritual we had to do. He read through the photocopy of dark meditations that I brought to see which dreadful one he felt the least uncomfortable to summon. After coming to a decision and memorizing the chant, we were finally ready. At exactly 11pm that night, Carter lied down on his couch and I sat on the same chair across from him. Then he closed his eyes and began the eerily weird whispered chant for the summoning and the pact. Garden eyes, come to me tonight. I want to be where dreaming souls should not be, but are welcome to be by your leaf-like eyes. Where the skies are always black, and the light is half of day and night, and the fruit is of a peculiar taste, and buried unconscious fears never go to waste. The lights in the house began to dim, and I swear I saw tiny, inky black shadows scurry along the outlines of the furniture, in the darker corners of the room, and the hallway leading to his bedroom and bathroom. Carter whispered on with the final sentence of the chant. I call to you, garden eyes. I wish to give you my fruit in exchange for fruit of yours translucent centipedes from as small as house centipedes to the size of snakes crawled across the floor. The lights were still on, but so dim that the light they were giving was as tiny candle flames ready to be blown out by a black wind. 
That familiar feeling of dreamlike dread began to flow through me, raising every single hair on my body. Regret tried sneaking into my mind, but I reassured myself that this was the only way to help Carter. That's when I noticed darkly transparent plants and bushes appearing through the walls and the floor all around us. The otherworldly plants then exposed their dreary colours, and I felt this unexplainable feeling of menace from them. My heart was racing, and I seriously believed that these unearthly plants from some nightmare beyond would drive me into fear-induced delirium from just their ghastly presence. Unsettling whispers faded into the air of the now darkly warped room. Whispers from men, women, and children in delirious fright and silent screams of utter horror. I wanted them to stop. I closed my eyes and prayed inside to whatever God was listening that it would be over. That all of this would be over and my friend would be rid of the grip of the foul evil he'd fallen victim to before. And then, suddenly, that maddening terror quickly faded away. I opened my eyes to see all those nightmarish plants and insidious insects had gone. Yet the lights of Carter's house were still as dim, still looking like that black wind would snuff out their tiny flames of light at any time. I looked at Carter, who was sound asleep. Then I remembered one of the rules mentioned for a ritual for summoning and making a pact with a dreadful one was to leave the summoner alone until they woke up on their own. So, I just got up grabbed a bottle of whiskey, sat back down and drank until I fell asleep myself. The next morning I woke up with a bit of a headache and the first thing I noticed was that Carter wasn't on the couch. I got up from the chair and called out to him. I noticed the bathroom door was open and there he was in a new clean suit, shirt and pants. When our eyes met though, I felt a tiny sense of unease. When I shook it off, believing it was just fallout from what had happened the other night. Hey, Carter, I said to him. How are you feeling? Fine, he replied. His tone was flat. So, um, what happened? I made a deal with garden eyes. Pure evil's gone from me. Well, just like that? I asked, surprised yet a bit sketched out. Yes. Just like that. Well, his voice, I swear it wasn't right. It wasn't that sinister, dreamy tone like Rowan's. It was just, well, monotone. His voice sounded and felt like there was no emotion there at all. Let's get back to work. Yeah, all right. I'm actually going to get back home and clean up. I'll see you there. Okay. As I walked out of his house into my car, I turned my head just to see him locking his front door behind him. Her eyes locked again, and I felt that same unease. I continued to feel it whenever I was around him, and it felt more and more eerie in the next homicide case that we worked on together. Uh, my partner was free from that foul evil that had grip on him before, but now he was, as the book had clearly mentioned, void in spirit. The next couple of weeks, as we worked on the next homicide case, most of the guys at HQ had noticed Carter's change. They asked him what was wrong, and he'd always reply with the same phrase in that same unsettling, emotionless voice. Nothing. Nothing's wrong. Our boss even had him psych-evaluated and tested for drugs. Nothing came up. No stress. Nothing in his system. Just this ominous, calm focus. He was still just as smart as he was before. It's just that Carter, well, the man Carter, wasn't there. The friend I'd known for years. Oh, it was just this void-like puppet inside his skin with only his memories and intellect. At the end of the second week of investigating this killer who'd stabbed random people who were alone in the streets at night, we finally caught the guy after getting the right leads of what this guy looked like and what his nightly routine was. Zachary Carlson. This 40-year-old psychotic bastard that lived in an apartment complex near the centre of the city, stalking his next victim, a woman in her mid-thirties. We were in our car that was parked across the street from where they were, knowing he'd take the street as his route on that Wednesday night. 
After calling it in, we got out and quickly approached Carlson, who already had his knife out and was ready to carve up his next victim. FBI, drop the knife now, I shouted at him. Carlson grabbed the girl and held her in front of him with the knife at her throat. Get the fuck back, he screamed. Get the fuck back or I'll spill this bitch's blood all over the frickin' pavement. Within just ten seconds, I heard a gunshot that was fired nine feet away from my right. Carlson's now bloody hand dropped the knife, letting the girl flee from his hold as he cussed a storm. Carter walked casually towards Zachary and kicked the knife far away from his reach. Carlson then looked up from his bloody hand to see my partner holding a Glock right to his head. Turn around with your hands behind your head, Carter ordered in that calm, monotone voice. Carlson did just that, and Carter smoothly and swiftly cuffed him. I was honestly taken off guard at what had just happened. Carter would have tried to talk Carlson down while the SWAT team would get a chance to get the clear shot, but he was so quick, and the girl wasn't even touched by the bullet that should have gone through Carlson's hand, but instead pierced into the handle of his knife. Police officers arrived ten minutes later, grabbed Carlson from us and took him to be locked up at the station. While I made sure Diane was alright, the girl that Carlson had targeted, Carter gave a simple and to the point summary of what had happened. I then left the coffee shop that Diane had fled to hide in after she got free from Carlson's hold. As I walked towards Carter, who was standing just at the passenger side of our car, I noticed he was staring blankly out towards nothing but it almost felt like he was staring out beyond the buildings he was facing. Once we got into the car, I told him that was a damn good shot. No response. So I just drove us back to HQ. The whole drive back just felt weird. Every time I looked over to Carter, he'd just be staring outward, blankly, to nothing. It just didn't feel right. Zachary Carson was interrogated by none other than myself. I got him to confess to everything. He was tried and sentenced to life in prison. But that wasn't the end of this. Not the end of the unsettling atmosphere that emanated from Carter. In fact, it got worse on our most recent homicide case. It was around 8.15pm when the sun was finally setting. We found four victims, naked, with their eyes missing, their wrists bound and their heads snapped back. All of them surrounded an oak tree. It's just like Rowan Linegreen's ritualistic murders. Yeah, these victims had crosses rather than eight-pointed stars. Four eyes, one eye at each end of the cross, and a mouth at the intersecting point of the cross. Well, the whole scene gave me vile flashbacks to Rowan and his disturbing house of that creepy shit we found there. I looked over to Carter, who was examining the bodies, and started walking away from them. Seemed like he was following some type of trail that I couldn't see. Carter, I called to him. What is it? Where are you going, man? He wasn't here too long ago, Carter replied in his empty, soulless tone. His scent is still lingering here. Not as strong as when he was here to summon it, but still strong enough for me to pick up on it. Wait, what? I asked, confused and a bit dizzy as I began to follow him. How can you smell his scent? And by summon it, do you mean a foul angel? Yes. He needs four more victims to cross over the bridge. What, you mean like what Rowan did? Yes. Oh, fuck. I don't want to go through this shit again. What am I supposed to tell Patrol? They were on his trail because he left a stinky smell. They wouldn't believe it. Just follow me. He's not too far. Under that ominous, dark, pinkish-blue sky, we walked through grassy fields for about two miles until we came across a mobile home park. I don't know why I didn't just pull Carter with me into the car and just have him point out where to go, but something pushed me along with him. It was like I was floating in an endless, vast river of Vanta black water, where I had strings bound to Carter who softly and unintentionally pulled me along with him through that flowing darkness. We soon arrived at the mobile home at the far back corner of the park, where dark oak trees huddled close to the house. I could then smell that familiar sweet stink, like we did when we first entered Rowan's house. My hand reached for my gun as I looked at Carter, who wasn't even reaching for his. You go first, I told him, 
not wanting to be the first one to enter that place that was housing another Rowan Linegrain. Carter nodded, now finally getting his gun out, and walked up to the front door with me on his left. The house only had a front door, so we had the sick bastard cornered. Carter then kicked the door open without breaking a sweat, and entered with his gun pointing out in front of him, perfectly pointing to the centre of the back of the head of our man. He was kneeling down, drawing what I assumed to be the foul angel he sacrificed those four poor souls to. I walked up in front of him and had my gun locked onto him. Detectives, he said in a sickeningly familiar soft voice. I didn't expect you to come this early. How did you... He turned around and his emerald green eyes widened with fear once he saw Carter. No, he cried. No, no, no. You're not supposed to be like that. Get away from me. He pointlessly reached for his bloody kitchen knife that was at his side, carrying into the corner of his couch like a scared child with the blade pointed only at Carter. He trembled with a fear I never thought I'd see on a vile man like him. My partner just stared at him. Eerily calm, he looked at the killer we should have been disturbed by, but this follower of absolute evil was terrified by the detective standing next to me, who still had his gun pointed at the foul man. Call it in, Carter told me without taking his eyes off of the murderer we cornered and had cowering. I stood, dumbfounded. What the fuck was going on? We should have been feeling ill from the pure unholy vileness that this man was, but well, all I could feel was this dismal otherworldly atmosphere that now snuffed out the violating aura that this house was giving off a moment before we'd entered it. Call it in. Carter repeated without changing his hollow tone. It was like a part of a song playing in a loop. After a minute of gathering myself, I called in the patrol and any nearby officers through my cell. As we waited for the officers to arrive, our suspect revealed his identity to us. What's your name? I asked him, feeling uneasy not from the agent of pure evil, but of the deathly still silent air. Marisol. He answered as he still shivered. Oliver Marisol. How many have you killed? Four. Just four. Where are their eyes? The foul angel took them. How did you learn about this type of shit? Ruin Linogreen taught me everything before he gave himself up to you guys. He knew I was curious about the existence of pure evil. Well, he wanted me to continue the work after he died. Do you know where he is? Carter asked him. He's there, Marisol told us, his voice shaking. He's where you went to, detective. But uh, something's wrong. You're not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to be evil's toy to violate. You're supposed to be sick. Why aren't you sick? I made a deal, my partner replied. I made a pact with a dreadful one. Does that ring any bells at all for you? Marisol was visibly ready to piss himself. His eyes widened even more and he slowly turned the knife towards himself. Before he could even get the point of the blade to touch the surface of his skin, though, Carter snapped Marisol's hand, making him release the knife. The foul man let out a disturbing scream of terror. Get off of me, he howled. Get off of me, get off of me, get off of me. No, Carter coldly told him, staring Marisol down with that abysmal, unsettling glare. I swear he didn't even blink once. Well, I shouldn't have been afraid, but I was. Carter, my partner, was deeply unnerving me to the point where I began questioning who in that room I should have been more afraid of. The man who served a timeless force of absolute evil... On the other man, it was a hollow, living puppet of some terrible, unseen alien puppeteer. My mind refused out of sheer terror to attempt to comprehend. The officers arrived and took Oliver Marisol away from Carter's powerful grip. We searched the mobile house and found nothing of great interest except for a cupboard of his supplies that he used to kill his four victims. After we were finished searching the place, we got a ride back to our car and then drove back to HQ. The ride back had me on edge since the man sitting next to me in the passenger seat caused a follower of absolute evil to try and kill himself out of terror. 
where we were to interrogate Oliver Marisol, but he refused to be interrogated by Carter. He wanted me to interrogate him alone, so I did. I sat across from him in the interrogation room and began my questions. So, Oliver, I said, did you kill those four people in a ritualistic way similar to Rowan Linegrain's? Yes, he answered, and he was still trembling, but not as intensely as when Carter was in his presence. Were you planning on crossing that bridge to that evil place you spoke of earlier? Yes. Why are you so afraid of Detective Carter? Oliver sat silently, staring at me wide-eyed with fear. His lips quivered, and I could see his hands grip his arms tightly, with his fingers digging into his skin. He's... <laughs> empty. He whispered like he was afraid of Carter, and that he could hear him even though Carter was outside of the room, at his desk, flipping through files. What do you mean, he's empty? I asked him. His spirit isn't there, Oliver explained. Well, it's there, but it's not fully there, you know. It's like he's a walking void. A void that isn't what we understand what a void normally is. A void that should not be there. A void that should not exist, if that makes sense. What the hell are you talking about? You know full well what I'm talking about, Oliver growled. You heard him say it. In fact, I think you had something to do with it. He made a pact with the others. The others? Yeah, the dreadful ones. Of the dark beings from realms where infinite nightmares exist in material and immaterial form, or beyond this reality. When he made that pact, which I know he did... His soul was stripped clean of what made his soul a soul in the first place. I myself, he's a vessel, but not of evil. Of what, then? An eternal, empty abyss that not even my god dares to penetrate. A horrible void that my god and his angels and followers all fear. A horrible void that all living things fear. I deeply regretted what I asked next. Does this horrible void you speak of have a god? Oliver went paler than snow. It's not a god, he cried. It's something worse. My heart sank and I felt an indescribable dread flooding my entire being. We're done here, I quickly told him. When he dies, you know where they'll take him, Oliver exclaimed. I signaled to the security guard to unlock the door. You've let something into this world that shouldn't be here. After I left the interrogation room, I told my boss that I was going home and that Carter could take care of the rest of the paperwork that needed to be done. Well, sleep didn't happen that night, and the dread has remained constant throughout every day, even away from work. I wanted to get reassigned because, well, I can't take the unbearable dread that intensifies whenever I'm with Carter at work. But I'm thinking about it now. It's pointless to get reassigned anyways. Like I said in the beginning, I don't know if I regret what I did. I, mean, I had to save my partner, but it ended up turning the world I used to understand into an abysmal, horrifying dream that isn't mine and that I can't wake up from. And what makes it worse is that, even if I do get reassigned somewhere far away, I'll still know what's out there in this universe. What terrors lie beyond this reality and what terrible thing pulls the strings of Carter, the empty puppet detective. Well, I get the funniest feeling that this story is not over yet by quite a long way. Um, yeah, very intrigued by the first part of this, and a lot of you were too. You said, it can't end like that, there has to be more, we need to know what happens. So I'm very glad that the author of this story has um, obliged and brought us a part two. So where do you think it can go? What do you think is going to happen next? I feel like it's uh, ripe for much more to happen <laughs> from now on. If you agree with me, then please say so, so maybe we can encourage this story to continue. Well, that's it for Friday. Hope you enjoyed that one. When will I be back again? Probably on Sunday. Something very big lined up for Monday that I've been recording on and off for quite a long time. That I think you're going to really enjoy, but probably back again on Sunday. 
Till then, my dear friends, have a lovely weekend, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.